So, Father, as we study tonight about how the Spirit of God is comforting us, teaching us, and guiding us, opening the eyes of our understanding, helping us order our steps, we'll learn about the tongues of power tonight in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Welcome to tonight's study. Good to see you, Sess. All right. Now, we broke off last week. Only on a couple of things, so I'm going to just bring our attention to that before we actually study the notes that you have that. So did you bring your notes from last week? And if you didn't, just listen, because I'm going to give you the scriptures for them. Okay? And again, also, too, I want us to participate when we can so that we get used to working with the Holy Spirit. Now, we know, just a couple reviews for us, we know that at the day of Pentecost, if you, 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, 50 days after the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God came into the earth. Now, what he brought was all the gifts of the kingdom of heaven. Everyone say all the gifts. All the gifts. And he will impart them to man. Amen. See, the gifts are, God doesn't need supernatural gifts. We need them. Because we're fighting a supernatural war. Now, folks, I need to declare that the war that we're fighting is not over our salvation. Right. Go ahead. It's over the lost people's salvation. Yeah, yeah. The ones that we're fighting are the spirits that yeah. hold them yeah. in bondage. Yeah. And we can start our warfare first thing in the morning. Yeah. Meeting with God and then say, God, lay a few people on my heart so I can pray for them. And when he lays them on your heart, he picks them because they're ready. Yes. If you ask God to lay the right people on your heart, he knows who's ready and who's not. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? And so it'd be better for him to lay that name or impress you on who that person is. And as you start praying, it's time. It's like the great harvest reaper comes in. Yes. Start reaping them. And one day, let's say that they're from Europe. But God lead this person. You see, you see that they're 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 not from here, and you don't know necessarily who they are. But you can see kind of a little picture. Say, Lord, I just claim that person. You was one of the ones I asked for to pray for. So, Lord, get that person saved, Father and Jesus. And then when we all gather in heaven, God's going to bring those people up, and they're going to say thank you, thank you for those prayers. I'm saved because you and many others prayed for me. And so it's very nice to know that the Holy Spirit's job is to teach us the specifics of our walk. We can get the general word. Can you say amen? We can read the word, study the word. That's what we're doing tonight. But then the Holy Spirit in our prayer time and our walk time can give us the specifics. For example, God may say, Joe needs help. And so the Bible says, go help your brother. So as I go, God says he needs help in this area. We always think the word help means Joe's in trouble, go help him. But it could be he needs somebody to hold the nail. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean we, we start interpreting what God wants. Don't do that. Okay? You got a finite mind and God doesn't. <laughs> All right, so let's learn. So we broke off the part where last week we, we were commissioned with power. Everyone say commissioned. commissioned. Now, when somebody's commissioned, it's like a police officer. They go to school. They go to the academy. They go to the training. Okay? And then they're commissioned as an officer. Can you say amen? amen. Well, the Bible said that Jesus commissioned all of us as believers to go into the world. But he said, you're not going out without any power. I'm going to give you power. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to empower you. Can you say amen? Now, I remember Teal Osborne in his testimony when he was a missionary, when he first went out for these assemblies of God to go out on the mission field. He went out with his little black book and the message of Jesus Christ. And everybody out there in India and stuff had their own little black books. He said, look, we got two black books. You only got one. And, and so he went back very discouraged because he says there's something lacking. And see, when we go out and we share with our, our relatives, our friends, 
what should be present in our life is the power of God. Can you say amen? So let's see what God said in John 14. Uh, in your notes from last week, it's just a couple of scriptures, so don't worry about it. John 14, 12 through 14, I'll read it to you. It says, Most assuredly, this is Jesus talking, I say to you, he who believes in me, do you believe in him? Yes. Okay. The works that I do shall he do also. Amen. Now, it didn't say if you believe enough, did it? Didn't say if you're just walking perfect. It says if you believe, the same works you can do. Okay, so now we need to meditate on that. We have the Holy Spirit. Why do you suppose he said something like that? I'll tell you real quickly. Because who lives in you? So God was saying, look, remember, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm not going to leave you without anybody. I'm going to come via the Holy Spirit. I'm going to come to you. And when you accept me, I'm going to come in. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit's going to come in you. So I'm going to do the work. You're going to lay the hand, and I'm going to do the power part. Can you say amen? All you got to do is lay hand. We're going to try a little bit of that tonight. All you got to do is lay the hand on and just release God. You don't have to have super amount of faith because all, it says all you that just believe. How many believers do we have? Amen. So it didn't say you have to believe and, and go to college for 20 years and be anointed by the super duper pastor dude. You know, no. What it says, if you believe, just act on the word because God lives in you. So let's read it with that premise. That idea, most assured, I say to you, the works that I do shall you do also, and even greater works than these. Everyone say greater works. greater works. Why? How could it be greater? Well, Jesus didn't have the internet. He didn't have the TV, he didn't have the radio. But he was God. No, that's, you got to realize something. We always throw that he was God over there. No, he was a man anointed by God. Amen. Okay, now listen, I'm not saying it wasn't God, but he didn't come down as God. Amen. Remember? So we always throw that in because the devil throws it in. Yes. Oh, yeah, the works that you do, but you know, he was God. <laughs> you see, and what that does is that puts us in a guessing instead of faith mode. Yes. And so you got to realize is, yeah, he was God. But he operated as a man. And because he operated as a man, he said, you could do that too because you're men and women. Now, what did he have that made him operate that way? Was it the fact that he was God but didn't come as God? No. It was the fact that his father lived in him. Yeah. And all he did is what we do. He let his father go out. Let me quote some scripture for you, okay? That which I see my father do, that do I. That which I hear my father speak, that do I speak. So where does he hear it? Some cloud comes over and, oh, no. He's got this father in him. And much the same, you and I have God in us. So when we learn, here's the, what takes us a long time. When we learn to receive, now listen, if I can say it right, I got to say it right. We can learn to recede back and sit down and let God stand up in us and proceed forward and we follow. Did that, was that a clear picture? In other words, we believe God, but God does the work, right? Yes. But he won't do the work if you're in the way. So what do we do? We back up, per se. I'm going to show you how, tonight how to do that. You back up and you rest. For example, somebody starts screaming at you. Instead of you entering in, you know, back off just a second, let Jesus rise. And he'll give you wisdom. Just back off a second. What does he say? Slow answer turns away. So with the, the slow answer part is, is not that you don't have an answer is you're kicking back to have the answer or that one with the answer to speak. The same thing with turning your cheek. When Jesus says somebody slap you on the one cheek, turn to him the other. 
what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples, it's no longer, guys, eye for an eye, two for two. We're not under the Old Testament. I'm going to tell you of a time where I'm going to intervene. So when you turn the other cheek, now they have to deal with me. But if you stand up and say, go ahead, try it out again, you're going to get belted. And you know what? God's going to stand back and say, here you go, getting in the way again. Does that make sense to you what I just shared? So the Lord teach us. No. Remember, if I say something you don't know, quite know, don't worry about it. Ask more questions afterwards. But also ask God to teach you how that operates with you. How you, you step back and let God arise. We sing a song like that. Let God arise and the enemies be scattered. Right? So the works that I do shall you do also. So just figure you can. Because God said so. Right? And because God lives in you, and because we're learning how to turn him loose, we're learning to turn God loose. Remember, you have a will. If you're unwilling to talk about Jesus, you won't. And if you're unwilling to turn God loose, or let me say it this way, or you don't know how, then let's teach you. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Everyone, let's turn God loose right now. Take a big deep breath. Shut your head off and bring God right out of your, out of your spirit. Say, Jesus. Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. Jesus. You see, what you're doing is learning to turn God loose. So, uh, somebody's not feeling good. Turn God loose. You understand? Don't deal, oh, I'm sorry. Well, yeah. And then hug him and then say, let's, let's seek God and let's turn God loose on this situation. Right? You got the hand, but God's got the power. Moses had the rod, but God did the parting. Can you say amen? God said to Moses, I love this part. What's in your hand, Moses? A rod. He says, stretch it out, hit the water. <laughs> Let me ask you, what do you have a left one of and a right one of? Hands. Lay your hands on the sick. It's the God in you that heals them. It's the God around them that heals them. And if they're Christian, it's the God in them that heals them too. Hello. So by the laying on of hands and the speaking the word, what you're doing is you're collectively getting God's presence to fall in an area. So let me explain this before we go on. Remember, in the very air that you and I breathe is God, right? It came at Pentecost. So, but it isn't until we put our mind on that we are breathing in and breathing out of God, do we sense God? You notice that? Or maybe you come into a service and they're singing your favorite song, and now you sense God. It just brought you to the attention of God so that you could have access to God. Can you say amen? If you don't know, the car is moving. Hello? Or if you don't know that something that you're sitting on can do a certain thing, you won't have the grace of that. But once somebody tells you, hey, you're sitting not only in this chair, but this chair talks, this chair walks. Wow, the benefits, you know, you, you follow what I'm saying? We need to know the benefits of what the Holy Spirit's job is for us. So that's what we're, so we can do the works that Jesus did. Why? Because we are delivery people. You are vessels full of God. Amen. And you're delivering God like water to the desert. Yeah. Amen? So, God, now listen, another thing about the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit's like water. How many's ever mopped the floor? <laughs> so, you put a little water on the floor, where's the water run? Everywhere. It runs onto the floor, but where's it go? It goes to the deepest cracks, doesn't it? It finds its way into the deepest crack. So is the Holy Spirit. So when you open up to God, let him get into those deep cracks inside of you. Get in there and lubricate all the fears and all the frustrations and stay there long enough. So he, he brings that up to the surface and gets rid of it. And you might find yourself blubbering and crying and, and going, oh, God, but I'm happy. He says, go ahead. Because he's saturating you. It's like that water. So when you speak... The word and the water comes out of you, it will go into the need to the persons listening. 
So if people are listening, it's like a crack where water seeks. So if you got somebody who's interested, pour Jesus out in your conversation. It will just fill all the cracks that they have in their need. And then you can look, you can watch their countenance change. And you go, would you like to accept him? And they'll go, yeah. So don't go any further talking. Lead him to the Lord. Are you with me? So you know you can do the works now. You know it says you can do it. He's just telling the disciples, everybody back then as well as today, we have hero conscious. We have our favorite teachers, our favorite churches, our favorite baseball players, or we like baseball or football. We have our heroes. Well, Jesus is saying to his disciples, look, don't look to me for everything. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And you, because you believe, he's going to endow you with power. All right? But here's what I want you to know, that you're as special as me, Jesus is saying. And the very things you see me do, you will do also, because I'll be with you. You're not doing this on your own. You and I are doing this in a partnership, and the Holy Spirit's going to show you how to do it right. Can you say amen? amen? So the next scripture gives us what we call the military strategics on how to take an area. The area could be a family or a neighborhood. Okay, now if you think about it, what does the military do? Well, we have ships. We have great big warships, you know. And before they come in and we, we release our troops, they shoot these big bombs, aerial bombs. We have jets come in and they bomb the area, right? Well, that's what your prayer is like. You shoot missiles of prayer into the area. So here's what happens. Jesus commissioned us, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And he commissioned us with power, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And so here he's saying, watch this. He says in Mark 16, verse 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe. He just got through saying, the works that I do shall you do also. And now after he's going to leave, he says, and these signs shall follow them but believe. In thy name they shall cast out demon, demons, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, they shall drink any deadly thing, and it will by no means hurt them, and they will lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Amen. All right, so here you got. All right, so here Pastor Kerry and Linda come into the area. We purchase the property of CCM. First thing that we do is we handle the controlling demon, the casting out the spirit that controls that area. Remember, Satan thinks he's the god of this world. So when you go into an area as a missionary, or if you're going on vacation in an apartment, or you're going to stay in a hotel, whatever area you go in, take possession of it. First thing you go in, is you deal with the spirit that was possessing that, that property. We came in, cast the controlling spirit over this property and over this area out in Jesus' name. Then it says, cast, you know, you shall cast out devils. Then you shall speak without new tongues. People don't know that the tongue, we're going to talk about it tonight, your tongues you got when you were born. Amen. Hello. Your tongues, praying in tongues, you got when your spirit came from God. You got a special language in your spirit. Now, the problem is, it's not till older after we get saved that that language get released again. Amen. You see, everything that Jesus releases in you is the same to the original that he gave you when you were born. Just remember, you were born in a sin market and when you got to the age of knowing right from wrong, sin took over and separated from you, God. But if you would have died at two or one, you would have gone directly to heaven. But you have a language in your spirit to talk directly to God. Bypasses your head. Now, how many's ever had your head get in the way? Your heart tells you to do something and your head talks you out of it. So now you know the language that God put in your spirit originally 
is the language that's released when you got your tongues spiritually. Now, you might be looking, uh, you maybe don't believe in, in the gift of speaking in tongues. You know, and that, that's up to you. I'm not here to convince you of anything. You don't have to have that, that speaking in tongues part of it to go to heaven. But everybody has their language. Hello? Did you know? This is why, and, and maybe even good old Baptists don't know how to answer this one. Why is it that we hear witches and people of the world speaking in weird languages too? How do you know ours is good and how theirs is bad? Well, every good gift comes from God, and every bad gift comes from the other dude. So when you hear God's gift, it sounds fruitful, it sounds airy, happy. And when you hear somebody who isn't saved, remember, you got the language when you were born. So if other spirits are involved, they can also release part of your language, but it will come out demonic. And so people have testified, I heard somebody, you know, in a witch covenant speaking in tongues. Yeah, but they were speaking devil tongues, and they're a difference. So let me clarify, that's a lot to say to make it simple. When you were born, when God put your spirit and your soul in the, in the embryo in your mother's womb, you're alive. You have your language. You are in direct communion with God. Then nine months later, you come out, and you're born in the world. And now you need to adjust. And as we get older and older, we're influenced, right? Mom and dad influences our peers. Everything's influenced, and of course, the enemy's working through this. But we're still alive. Now, some uh, young people, they're raised in Christian families. So they don't really necessarily, you know, have the temptations of others. My wife is one. She didn't go out and do drugs, do all that kind of stuff that some of us did. So she just tried to transition. Some people, it's just a kind of a transition. Oh, it's time for me to get saved. My kids were the same way. Uh, to make a long story short, when they got old enough to know right from wrong, God drew them to the altar. And so at that time, I had a huge church. And I gave an altar call, and here's my son wandering towards the... And so the ushers went to get... Think, thought he was out of order, so they went to sit him down. I said, leave him alone. He's responding to the altar call. We know in our hearts, see. So anyway, it says, when you go into the area, cast out the devil, speak in tongues. Why? By speaking in tongues, you build yourself up yes. for battle. Amen. The next one says what? It says, speak in tongues, okay? And it says, cast out devils, speak in tongues, and they shall what? Take up what? Now, this is the one everybody gets all messed up. To take up serpents doesn't mean handle snakes. It means take up the local devils in the neighborhood. Hello? You never met a neighbor that's a devil? Has treated you so bad and done things? Huh? Now, I'm not, they're really not a devil, but the, the devil's using them. You follow what I'm saying? They're really not a devil. But the idea is, remember, that person, that's why you pray over your doctors and you pray over your dentists, because those people have a different God than you do if they're not saved. So don't be a dummy and go in there and just expect everything. No, you pray. Can you say amen? So it says, pray in tongues. You can handle the serpents. In other words, after you pray in tongues, you've got the wisdom of God. If Satan tries something, like in Ananias or Sophia, in Acts chapter 5, you can catch it. And then it says if you drink any deadly thing, so it says you can handle the local devils that were operating in that area, and not only that, but if they want to poison you, start rumors about you, or poison your meals, poison your water, because back then they did such things. I wouldn't say they did it so much nowadays. And guess what? It will by no means hurt you. And you shall lay hands on the sick. So this is a breakdown how to take over an area. You come in, you bind up the devil and control that area. Because a greater than he is there, you brought God. Second, you pray in tongues, build yourself up, 
get the wisdom of God. And then when the enemy starts coming against you, remember Paul on the Isle of Matos? He never had a problem until the fire got hot. Then the serpents came out. And God getting the fire hot in our church. So you, you want to make sure you handle all the dumb, dumb stuff. Yeah. Hello, all right? And, you sh and then it says, and if they give you anything, it won't hurt you. So instead of wondering, because I was, a witch tried to poison me one time. That's another story. I don't have time to talk about it tonight. But then it says you shall lay hands on the sick. So you go in, take care of the devil. You pray in tongues. You deal with this, the, the devils in the area. And if they try to poison you, it's not going to affect you. You're going to keep going. And then you go start getting people healed. You're going to have revival. Just follow those steps. Can we follow those steps, Pastor Kerry? The Bible says, and God work with them, confirming the word with signs following. Yes. God's no respecter of persons. Are you with me? Let's go on to the next one now. The, the comforters come, tongues of power. I told everybody, uh, tune in tonight if they get a chance, and we're going to teach you about the secret gift. This is it. Tongues. This is the one Satan fights really, really hard. You know, it's of the devil. It's misused. It's this, it's that. Uh, you know, it's only for the called. It passed away. There's all kinds of lies out there. And this is what I figure. If Satan didn't think it was so powerful, he wouldn't make up so many lies about it. Hello. So to receive your gift of speaking in tongues, you can receive it anywhere because you got the, the tongues in you already. You just got to release it out. Now, remember what I t showed you about three weeks ago? I put my hands on my head yes. and I thought good prayers towards you. Do you think you can sense on those good prayers? Same thing if you pray silently, there's no power in it. The same thing if you... Think about moving in the spirit, but you don't speak those tongues out, then it doesn't have a generating power. You see, it's, you have an alternator in your car. Everyone say alternator. alternator. Do you know what the difference is between a generator and an alternator? Can I tell you? Yeah. A generator in the olden days just generated. So they had to have one of those uh, sparkers. So when you turn your ignition on, they had to have enough juice in the battery to turn it over. So when you're, as long as you ran the car, it would run. But if you took the battery cables off a generator, the car would stop. Now an alternator is like a generator, but you could take the, the poles, the battery cables off your battery and your car will still run because the alternator is alternating current and charging everything. So it'll run without a battery. Just don't turn it off. <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying? You got an alternator in you, not a generator. His name is God. And the tongues are the belt to that alternator. And when you speak out loud your tongues in your prayer closet, we, we, we won't go through the different uses, but in your prayer closet and or maybe at the store, you're, I do what I call the idle shuffle. When I'm at the store, so nobody knows what I'm you know, doing, but I am verbalizing the tongue, the language that's coming out of my spirit. And I, well, do you know what you're saying, Pastor Kerry? Not all the time. In fact, hardly at all. It's not for me to know. My job is I am literally keeping everything charged. And so we meet with God during the day, first thing, right? But during the day, you're going to come against pressures and certain trials that are going to come. And that's why you want your little, your tongues going. Because it will alert you before problems come. It will draw whatever you need to pressurize. You ever been swimming? How many know that when you dive down pretty deep in the water, your ears got to be pressurized? You got to stop and blow on your then.
Amen. And so, and so when you go, when you dive down, the pressure pushes on your ears. Stop and and take some of what's in your lungs and, and blow it back on your ears, and you'll pressurize your ears. And so that's what when we, when we use our language, that's what you're doing in the spirit. You know, you know, I'm just faking the tongues. Okay, but you know, so then pressure comes. You just it just evens everything out. So that's why Satan fights the tongues of power a lot. There's so much more. So let's go through this thing. So we know that in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and filled all the whole house where they were sitting. Can you bring this hand held up a little bit too? And then there appeared on them, now listen, divided tongues as of fire. Okay, everyone say fire. fire. Somebody the other day asked me, he says, what's the fire for? Ba Jesus shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The fire is a, not a negative thing. The fire is God in you. We always want to treat the fire as like a forest fire, going to burn away all the... No, God consumes the chaff the worthless things in our life, but he does it without burning you. He consumes it without burning. He gave us a picture of that in the burning bush in Moses' time. He noticed the bush is on fire, but nothing was being consumed. Our God's a consuming. He lives in you. So while we're praying in the tongues, power is coming out of us are pressurizing we are praying perfectly there's no error in it and it bypasses our understanding thank god because there's been times where i've been in a situation on the mission field and also in situations of life where i didn't know how to pray about it but that my spirit knew how to pray and it just came and i'm going whoa lord what is that god knows who lives in us God, but remember, God will not wiggle your tongue. He will not cause your mouth to open. You're going to have to yield him. Amen. Same principle is sitting back and letting God arise. Step back. Let God step forward. Amen? And you say, well, how often do I need to do that? All the time, because whether you know it or not, if you're like me, God forbid, we always step in front of God and don't know it. Come on, you know what you're like when you vacuum, always stepping on the cord. Amen. So wrap the cord up in your hand so it doesn't, where you can step on. Utilize your, your language. So let's look at this. So we know that we were empowered on the day of Pentecost, right? Okay, so let me point out this fact. Moses received the law on Pentecost, the first one, and we received power after Pentecost, after the resurrection of Jesus. Now, what are we going to do with it? So the Holy Spirit must work with the Scripture. Everyone say, the Holy Spirit works with Scripture. Okay, now let me tell you why. The Spirit giveth life, but the letter kills. I said it in reverse. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. What are you saying, Pastor Kerry? If we just got the Bible and no spirit, we're going to cut people. We're going to blast them with the word. You need the Holy Spirit to go with the word so it becomes like God. Hello. So let me give you an example. How many here remember some of your history? Remember in your school way back before cars? You know? In history, I remember this. How many remember the term dark ages? How many remember the term renaissance? Okay. Dark ages happened after the third century when Augustine, ruler of Rome, decided to get together with the, the pagans, the world satanic people. They, they worshiped the devil and the Nephilim and all that kind of stuff. And he decided that they, they were fighting all the time, and he says, I know what I'll do. Let's put them together. 
and he created, in the third century, he made a pact with the devil, and made a pact with the pagans, made a pact with the Christians, and created the Catholic Church. Now, I'm not putting the Catholic Church down, but I'm saying the Catholic Church, the Pope, in the Vatican is right over one of the biggest places where Satan came down when he fell. So here are the Catholic Church is cutting over there, built their big thing over in Europe, right where they had all the false temples and everything over all that mess, and made a pact with the enemy and God, and decided they were going to mix the two together. So they took the Bible out of the hands of the commoner, the scrolls and everything, and they put it into the church. And in order for you to understand anything of the Bible now, you had to find a priest, just like the Old Testament, and go ask him. Most people didn't want to bother with it. And so the, the whole light of God began to be held under a bushel called the Catholicism. And they, they hid the church, and the word got hidden in monasteries, and darkness flooded in. Because the entrance of God's word works with the Holy Spirit, and the word gives us light. So they took the Bible away from mankind and gave it only to the priest and the Catholic Church. And that's why God says, no, you're going to have a reformation. Martin Luther said, no, it isn't a church that we have salvation. It's the Word of God. And he started getting the Bible printed again. And that's what brought Renaissance. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? When you take the Word away from people, they flood into darkness. That's why you can take a drug addict and just go put him in church. Just keep hearing the Word, hearing the Word, hearing the Word. The Word will drive the drugs right out of that person. They can get enough Word in them. That's why the people came to Jesus in the beginning. But the church, they've been covering it up. So how does the Word and the Spirit work together? Well, you remember the Gutenberg Bible press? He started printing the Bible and putting it in the hands of the commoner again. And people started seeing the light. And they started proclaiming. And all of a sudden, creativity and, and, all kind, and the Renaissance was born. Listen, you can't hide the word. Hello? So the Catholic Church took the word and changed it into their own dogma. Now, again, I'm not putting the Catholic Church down because most Catholic now, they don't believe in any of this. But this is what happened. I did a lot of studying, okay? So Satan's a masterful person. He will take the word away from us. He'll say, oh, you got the spirit. You don't need the word. And so what happens if you get the spirit and no word, you end up becoming a flake for Jesus. Because if you don't understand what the word means, you're going to do all kinds of crazy things because you're getting goosebumps. And we call that charismaniaism. People are falling down and doing weird stuff and whacked out. They're not following the word. So we need both the word and the Spirit working together in our life. Can you say amen? amen? So I will give you the Word, you study the Word, but when you go in to see God, He gives you the Spirit. Can you say amen? And when you walk with Him, He gave you a secret weapon, your tongues of power. And by exercising those throughout the day, you keep yourself full. Now, treat it this way. Imagine that we got a glass of water sitting up here, Okay, and it's open, and I take coffee grounds, not not made, not used coffee grounds, but you know unused coffee grounds. They're real light, and I sprinkle it all over the top. You know, even though you probably would drink it and just push the coffee grounds aside, it doesn't appeal to you, does it? No, that's what Satan does. He drops coffee grounds in all of you, making you not so appealing. But you see what? If every day we meet with God, we get tanked up. And then we use our language during the day, the water keeps flushing. So if I put a little bit of coffee grounds on top, but there's a big, huge pitcher of water being poured in there, it's shoving all the coffee grounds out. And that's what, you, you collect coffee grounds throughout the day. But 
you collect junk. And by using your language, you pop it off you. That's why back in the day when people began to understand this, and it's gone away for a while, we need to bring it back, is you could see the countenance just shine on them. Why? Because they're always full. It'd be always topping off your gas tank. You get in the morning and somebody filled it up for you. And you run it all day, you get in, you go to bed at night, you wake up in the morning, somebody came out during the night and filled it up for you again. Wouldn't that be great? That's what you do. You keep filling yourself up by using that language. And what does it do? It bypasses the polluted zone. Everyone know what is the polluted zone in your life? Your brain. Hello? Sure, sure. Because if you think about it, we analyzed people before we were saved by what we experienced. And if we had a bad experience, then everybody's a jerk. <laughs> Hello? If we had a good experience, then we become gullible. We need the Holy Spirit to guide our steps. Can you say amen? All right, so the Holy Spirit must work in conjunction with the Scripture in our life. John 1, 1 through 4 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him, say, I'm in him. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. All right, so we know that God is light. In him is no darkness at all. Let's go through those points right down there. Point one, the word and Jesus are the same. Even though you have one imprinted, form it's the same the old testament one di dispensation where they're looking towards messiah and new testament while we walk with messiah amen two colossians 1 16 and 17 says all things were made by him and by him all things are held together here's a neat thing i mean it took about five years into my christianity when I discovered what the word means, that by Jesus, all things are consist. Say consist. How many here have glue? How many's ever broke something, but you use a little glue and you put it back together? What Jesus is, if I can use this, is the very glue to hold your life together. If you keep him center, I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna make mistakes, and I'm not talking about that. But if you honor him and keep him first, he'll keep your life so together, even when the enemy's trying things. You, how many's tasted that that's what's going on? When you started honoring him like that, all of a sudden things started coming together. That's what that means. When we put him first, he literally keeps us all glued together. Now you take a marriage. My wife and I have a wonderful marriage. But that's because Jesus is in the center of that and he's holding our marriage together. So remember, Jesus must always be the focus and the respect of your heart. Can you say amen? Thirdly, if I can paint a picture with the words that I speak, like wireless, let's imagine we're wiring up this building. Okay, so words are like electric wire. We put it all through the building, right? It's going to carry a charge, isn't it? When we flip the switch, it's going to carry the charge. So we're wiring the building. Now, the switch is Jesus' name. And the power is the Holy Spirit. So listen, I'm going to do this for you. And hopefully we'll get through quite a bit tonight. But you who pray like we do, you pray the word like an electrical cord and wrap it around the problem. When you do that, the current is already in there because the Spirit works with the, the Word, and the Word's the cord, and the Spirit's power. So while you're taking your words, which is Scripture, and you're wrapping it around the cancer, the power of God to heal it 
is with the word that you speak. You need to see this, see? You need to see this. And then when you're ready, just like little Joe Anderson and I will explain that, and, and God shows you, then Jesus' name, you pop the switch on. And the power just zoo, takes care of the situation. And he sent forth his word, and it healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. Psalms 107, verse 20. You can dig cancer out of somebody in Africa. The key is, is we're not as good as sharpshooters as we think we are. We need to go back to the shooting range, prayer time, and ask God to help us to become more accurate instead of just shuffling off general prayers. Sometimes we need to be specific. So did you get the picture about wrapping the cord of the word around it, Lord? Carrie needs a blessing. So Lord, your word said you'll be blessed going in and blessed going out. So you're wrapping the word around me, see? And Lord, you said that no weapon formed against him will prosper. And you're wrapping the word around me. And you says, Lord God, that you'll bless his hands and bless his stall, and you will do all these things because that's what your word says. And you're wrapping the word around. Then, <coughs> then you know that the power is present while you're wrapping the word around them, and then you just wait just for a minute, say, okay, Lord, in Jesus' name, yes. and then the current just comes on, yes. and you know that the package has been delivered. Yes. You see, when I pray a prayer, and I give it to God, and I release it in Jesus' name, the package is gone. I don't speak anything against that package. If I release a package and believing in prayer, I'm not going to talk like, I certainly hope so. I'm not going to talk anything like that. Nope, in Jesus' name, I wrapped the cord around it. I did what God said. I made the petition. I have the power. And God says, you have the same ability as I do. In the name of Jesus, yes. boom. Amen. See, now you're a skilled, seasoned believer because you understand the power of prayer. And the tongue part, Satan's not going to talk you out of using because that very keeps you powered up. It's like carrying a hot spot everywhere you go. You're not looking for internet. You got it everywhere you go. You just got to practice what this talks about. The Bible says we are doers of the word and not what? Hearers only. Okay. So, the spirit must work with the scripture. So that's why you'll, you'll see a lot of people, there doesn't seem to be much power in their life. And yet you see them, oh, and they're all doing the whole Holy Ghost thing. And there's, I don't think they could pop a little fly off a pimple. You know what I mean? And it's all a bunch of noise and everything. You want to realize that well-placed power and well-spoken word can change things. It says, by faith, we understand that the elders framed their worlds through the word of God, Hebrews 11. Are you still with me? So a couple of points I want to give you. Number one, the word and Jesus are one. Number two, Colossians says, who do holds us together? All right, and our example is, is this type illustrated. I want to give you a wrapping the cord around and, of course, the Dark Ages. How did the Dark Ages get over with? The preaching of the word. Amen. And then all of a sudden, they had revival everywhere. You want to find out? Many times in the Old Testament, you'll read places. And one time, it was why Eli, it says Eli the prophet, it says was, he was about ready to die. His children were rebellious. And they, were def they were kind of putting down the temple of God and everything. And God went and visited him and says, hey, you want to get it together, you know? <laughs> yes. And so he said he repented and God put some more favor in his life. But Eli was sloppy. God doesn't want us to be sloppy. Can you say amen? All right. Peter speaks the word and the spirit moves. Smith Wigglesworth I said that wrong. Smith Wigglesworth only had a fifth grade education. 
and a whole bunch of people. Now, by the way, just in case you were Catholic back, I have not a thing wrong with Catholics. We have a, a lot of them here. So they just love the Lord. They just focus on not the religion, but, but the Lord. But um, Smith Wigglesworth was asked the question, how is it we're waiting for God to move, and everywhere you go, God is moving? And here is his answer. He says, you know, when I come to a meeting and everybody's waiting for God to move, I can only wait so long. Then I get up and I move God. And you go, what? And these people are going, whoa. He says, I start preaching the word. That moves God. I start telling people about Jesus. That moves God. Everybody's waiting for God to show up so they get a few goosebumps, and then they're going to do something. Now, uh get up if you have to and preach the word. One time we had this real, real New Testament prophet show up in a little teeny meeting in Buckley. And the guy came in, his flight was all messed up. I mean, he just went, he wasn't ready at all. But as soon as he walked into the meeting, you could see the anointing drop down on him by the Holy Spirit. And God only gave him a one word to tell to us. He says, I brought you a good word from afar off. And then he started just preaching. Spirit of God moved, people got healed. But you, you bring what God's word, not what you think everybody needs. Can you say amen? All right, so Peter speaks the word. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 48. This is, I love the book of Acts, by the way. You get a chance to read that. Put yourself in there with everybody. Just put yourself in the crowd with Peter and Paul and just as one of the people that's watching, okay? And read Acts that way, all right? So he says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those that what? Heard the word. Remember, the Spirit works with the word. So Peter spoke the word and the Holy Spirit worked with the word word and so verse 4 says and those of the circumcision jewish people who believed were astonished as many as came with peter because the gift of the holy spirit had been poured out on the gentiles also also for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify god and peter answered can anyone forbid water that these should be not be baptized who received the holy spirit just as we have right? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and they asked him to stay a few days. So here's something that happened just like me. When I received Jesus, I got my language at the same time. And not only that, ended up on the floor. Now, if you would look at that, you would say, well, I must not have got saved there, because when I got saved, I didn't get any language, and I did end up on the floor. Everybody's different, silly. Amen. Amen. Maybe I needed to pull off my high horse. Don't you laugh up there, dear. <laughs> anyway, so Peter was speaking. The Holy Spirit fell on him, right? So listen, when you're sharing from your heart with a relative or a friend, and you're speaking out of your heart the things that you know about God, the anointing will be right there. The spirit and power will be right there. Keep your eye on their face and eyes. Because when you're sharing, you keep your eyes on their face and eyes will light up and God will tell you when they're ready. It's called your countenance. So when you're sharing, many times I've stopped. It says, you want him now, don't you? And they'll say, yeah. I says, let's pray and I'll continue to share afterwards. And you just have them pray after you. Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, be my Lord and Savior. That's all you need to pray. Because what happens? A person that is not saved, when he gets saved, let me say this quickly. When you're not saved, you're an enemy of God. And so you come to God and you surrender. You say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. Come into my heart. And God says, that's all I need. You're on my side now. He accepts us. He adopts us. He fills us with the Spirit. You know, that's what he does. But see, Satan has wrapped it all up into some kind. Well, you got all your friends are going to leave you. You're going to have to give up this. You're going to doubt. And just lays a big. 
No, you just share with them. And when you're sharing the truth with them, you'll be able to tell when they're ready. Say amen, somebody. All right, so a couple of things I want you to know. Notice when the word was spoken, those that heard the word, the Spirit of God fell on. Remember, there's probably a lot of people there weren't listening. Sound like some congregations. <laughs> they hear a sound, but they don't know what's being spoken. Two, when the Holy Spirit moves and fills our spiritual language, then is released. You have the language already in you. You know, you had that at when you were born as a human being. But all that got pushed in aside and everything. Then you got Jesus in your heart. Everything was relit. Now, you might not yield that language, and we'll teach you how to yield to it. But maybe you have, you have the language, though. A lot of people have a hard time for it to get it out because the brain's always standing in the way and saying, I'm not like, going to let you say that. That sounds stupid. I mean, if you're going to talk like that, I'm just not going to listen. And it will play games like that because it's jealous. So let's go on past this, okay? Another thing, too. Third thing, the Spirit works with the Word. So we, that's why I'm always telling you, get in the Word. Get in the Word because the Spirit needs the Word. So if you're not in the Word and you don't know much, now listen, this is something that is sobering, but I want you to listen. The Holy Spirit can only work with you in line of what you know of the word. So if you know God loves you, the Holy Spirit can work and God love you. But if you know God loves you and has forgiven you, then, oh, I'm forgiven too, you know? So the more we learn of the word, the more the Holy Spirit can utilize you because you actually have something to share. So let's say you don't know much about the word. What should I do then, Pastor Kerry? Don't stop sharing. Share your testimony. Share what Jesus is doing for you. I did that for about an hour, and two people came to know the Lord. One person, literally, the power of God floored them to the ground in the men's bathroom and sobered them up. All I was doing is sharing about how Jesus met all my needs and took care of me, and I, I'm, you know, and both the bartender and this drunk next to me got saved, you know. And you go say, well, what are you doing in a bar? It was a restaurant bar. And they're the only ones there, and God told me to go in there, and guess what? God got the results. But got it because I, was, I didn't share the word with them. I didn't preach at them. I just shared what God was doing in my life. Amen. So there comes a time for that, too. Can you say amen? amen? All right, fourthly, they afterwards got baptized in water. Notice they got spirit-filled first, though. All right, so let's go to the next one. Power on display. Everyone say Power. Acts 10, 38, talking about Jesus. It says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. You see, Jesus of Nazareth had to be anointed, and he had to be given power. So he didn't come down in his godhood, did he? He was anointed. Yet he was God by decree. He didn't come because he would be disqualified if Jesus came in his God power. When Satan says, command these stones, be made bread, if Jesus would have changed them to bread, he would have been operating in divine God power, not Holy Spirit anointed power. He would have disqualified himself to die in our spot. Why does the tempter come? Why does the tempter tempt you? To try to disqualify you. Here's the deal, though. Guess what? doesn't matter if you fall down a hundred times. You're not disqualified in God's eyes. Just get right back up, and God's working with you. So don't plan to fall, but when you do, don't think the, the whole thing is over with. It's not at all. Get up. It's not how that you fall. It's how you get up. And believe me, sometimes Christian brothers and sisters, they'll just laugh when you fall. And pay them no mind, but the good ones, they'll help. Can you say amen? All right, so tongues and amplifier. All right, so let's look at this. How God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. That's the Greek word dunamis or dynamis, if you want to say that. Okay, power here is dunamis. Okay, all right. It means explosive power. 
to display the works of God and destroy the works of the devil. Miracle working power as quoted in Isaiah 61. How God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and with dunamis. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus said to the disciples, go to Jerusalem and wait till you be dude with dunamis. Explosive power. Everyone say explosive. explosive. Amen. So with Joanna today, when she came, she had to leave early. She said she had a little plug in her ear. And so I said, well, did you ask God to pray? You know, I want her to use God that lives in her. More and more trust in the God that lives in her and not call everybody up. Say, pray for me, pray for me so much. It's okay, though. So I, I said, she said, yes. And I said, well, let me pray for you. And while I was praying, God showed me what to do. He showed me to lift my hand and just pop her just slightly on the ear. And when I did, God snapped it open and healed her. But see, I saw God do it. Then I just followed what I saw. Who was showing me? The Holy Spirit. He will show you things to come. Everything that I've done is God has done through me. That's the best way. Everything that God's done through me, I saw first. And I just followed it. I mean, any dummy can follow some instructions, can't you? You don't have to be magic. You don't have to be super spiritual. That's what these people that operate super spiritual, sometimes they get these big heads, and they kind of float around, oh, I'm a special, you know, and everything. Listen, if you are a tremendous anointed man or woman of God, you should be the humblest man in the room. Not the one that sits around and giving out autographs. You're going to lose that. You're going to shut down that power. God's not going to take it away from me, but you'll clam it over with flesh. Uh, I could go on so many stories. People starting off with power and looking like dummies later on because they thought they were doing it. Oh, shit. You know, you learn all that stuff. Remember, you're just carrying God. Hello? Remember the little donkey that carried Jesus into Jerusalem? And everybody's yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna. I kind of think that donkey thought, wow, I'm special. <laughs> and if we're not careful, we get to thinking we're so special. And the Bible says, be careful you think not more highly than you ought to think. But to think soberly, as God has dealt to each man the measure of faith. Are you with me? So we know that God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth, right? So also, here's some more Greek words for power. The word for power, to use power, is the Greek word exousia. It's in your notes there in uh, point two, under power on display. There are five Greek words for power. Exousia, dunamis, kretos, iskus, and energeia. Everyone say energeia. energeia. Sounds like a, uh, like a YouTube video, huh? <laughs> okay, the word ex uh, exousia is what we get in John 1, 12. And you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But in, in John 1, 12, it says, as many as received Jesus, he gave them authority to use power. That's the word, exousia. So the devil doesn't have authority to use power, but you do. The devil is a thief and a robber, so he's just a con artist. He cons you out of your power. Oh, God's not telling you you today and sit around and cry. <sighs> You're giving the devil power. Stop that. He just loves to see you just mess up like that. We're almost done with you. So the next word, okay, kratos, it means might and strength. So you have authority to use kratos, might and strength in operation. Not your might, God's might. The next one is iskus. Everyone say iskus. It literally, iskus is a neat word because iskus means the ability, okay, to, to be bold and forceful. In other words, suddenly God comes up in you and you're, boom, 
you know, because something is trying to get in the way. Amen. There's a time that that can happen. Yeah. Okay, there's a time. So I'm talking without the mic up there. <laughs> <coughs> so the boldness can come on you. Amen? So you want to be open to all of this. Remember, God lives in you. Yeah. All right, so let's go to the next word. So you got iskus, you got, you got exousia, kretos, iskus. All right, and the next one is energeia. It's where we get the word energy. Yeah. It means to charge up. Okay, and it is God who's working in you. The word working there is the word energeia. God is energizing in you. Can you say amen? All right, so we got authority to use power, kratos, a mighty strength. We have iscus, bold forcefulness in execution. Energeia, energizing to efficiency. And dunamis, the ability to produce miracle working power on display. All in Ephesians 1.19. So we'll have to break it off right there, okay? So we'll take up next week, tongues, the amplifier of power. All right, Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for it, what it's ability to do. And as we do our little workshops, Lord God, let us focus in on you, Lord, and we just appreciate what you have. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen.